returning to this equation, using a forward difference in time now. So we're going to take, again, we're going to want to discretize our time, uh, our derivative with respect to time using forward difference, right? So that is something like that, and of course, you know, this is for any, you know, ti, if you will. Well, let's use the, let's, let's use tn, little, little n, tn. Let's use tn uh, plus delta t, Minus t uh, minus p at t n, and we'll we'll assume the delta t's are the same, and we'll then introduce a similar notation as we did before. It's just now we're going to have uh, a superscript instead of a subscript, so we'll have uh, p at n plus one minus p at n all over delta t. All right. So we're going to use this uh, back up in this equation here to discretize the time. Right? We'll multiply the equation by delta t to get, to get that out of the denominator. And we have, actually let's, let's write this on a new page. So we have the identity matrix times solution vector at n plus 1 minus the solution vector, the spatial solution vector, right, at n plus alpha delta t over delta x squared, because again, we've, if we've multiplied through by delta t, that multiplies a times p, and all of that's equal to zero. Zero vector. So, now notice over here on the, on, on this term, we don't have a superscript on P. So it's actually up to us to decide how we want to discretize this in time. Do we want to choose to evaluate this P at the time step N plus 1, or we want to do it at the time step N? All right. Well, let's see what happens uh, if we choose this to be n, right? So we're going to evaluate at time step n. Right? So again, just N, and we can then solve this equation in terms of, you know, what we're, what we're looking for is the pressure at the next point in time, right? So we can solve this equation in terms of P N plus 1, and if we do that, we have
something like that. So this is called, uh, of course, you know, there's a, uh, we're taking the inverse uh, of the identity matrix and multiplying by both sides. It doesn't change anything. So what this is called is the explicit formulation. And the reason it's called explicit, I mean, if you look up ex the word explicit in the dictionary, it means something like to write down plainly, right? And so in this case, uh, we, we don't have to really solve a linear system of equations, right? We just take the initial vector of um, pressures, uh, spatial vector of pressures, and just multiply it by this equation, then, you know, we update P uh, at N becomes P at N plus 1, and then we plug it back in, and we just continue to do this over and over, marching on in time. Now, it turns out that this is very simple, but there's a severe restriction in how large um, of steps you can take, or the accuracy or the stability of this solution. And so it turns out that, uh, you know, without going into the details, that this constant up here has a special meaning, and that this, this constant here um, must be less than or equal to a half for this method to be as stable, okay? And so you can see, if you remember what we said earlier, we, we want small delta x's for accuracy in our spatial solution. But if we make delta x too small uh, compared to delta t, then we, you know, for accuracy in the spatial solution, then we could get in a scenario where this is less than a half and, and the, the solution would be unstable. And when I say unstable, it means that errors from one iteration to the next would grow unboundedly. They would get larger and larger and larger and kind of blow up. So uh, because you want small delta x for your spatial solution, uh, and this stability criterion would require that delta t also be very, very small for accurate solutions. So sometimes these explicit solutions aren't really uh, good in practice because they re you have it re it's a severe restriction on the time step size that you can take. Of course, we want to run simulations reservoir simulations that run for days or years, and, and you know, if we're forced to take time steps on the order of seconds, it's going to be very computationally expensive to get there. So with that in mind, let's see what happens if we evaluate, you know, P, and when I'm talking about P, of course, we're talking about this P. Uh, if we evaluate P at P, n plus 1. So again, just for to be clear, I'll write out all the terms. Now, this is P at n plus 1. And that's equal, all of that is equal to the zero vector. Okay. So now if we solve this guy for P at n plus 1, we end up having to solve a linear system of equations. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is we have to invert a matrix, right? So this is a matrix here, and we have to have it take its inverse and multiply by P at N. And this is what we call the implicit method.
And the implicit method is actually unconditionally stable without going into details. So um, th there's no restriction on the time step size you can take, but of course at each step we have to then solve a linear system of equations. So we can take arbitrarily large delta t's, but every time we do, um, we have to solve uh, this, we have to invert this matrix, which, you know, in any time you have to solve a linear system or invert a, a matrix, then it's more computational expense than just doing a matrix vector multiplication like you do up here. Right? So again, we have the implicit method. And we have the explicit method. So we'll come back to this in a few lectures and talk about a, a third method that's sort of a mix between the explicit and implicit method. Um, but um, we'll go ahead and end this for now.